recording this and that is going good. All right, so we'll finish up with um, a few slides about, about free energy and, um, and uh, equilibrium, how they apply to each other. And then I'll show you guys how to run some, some um, calculations online um, to actually get some numbers that we can actually plug into this equation. So quick recap of where we were. Delta G was our, our um, measure of whether something will happen spontaneously or not. Because if delta G is less than zero, then the reaction is spontaneous. And the other thing that's interesting about delta G is it's actually dependent on what your concentrations are as well. Um, because the, the forward reaction and the back, backward reaction are going to be based on what your starting concentrations are, um, that, that means that delta G is actually going to change as your concentrations change. Because if you start entirely with reactants, even if it's a non-spontaneous process, if you have zero product, you will spontaneously make a little bit of product until you get to the, your equilibrium constant, right? Because everything's an equilibrium reaction. So if everything's an equilibrium reaction, means every reaction, even if we would classify it as non-spontaneous, will happen at least a little bit until you get to your equilibrium constant, until you get to that right ratio of products over reactants. Um, and so, so what we're normally looking at, if it's delta G naught, delta G naught means under standard conditions. That means assuming you start with one mole per liter of everything, including reactants and products. If you start with one mole per liter of everything, reactants and products, it's going to shift one way or the other based on where, where your equilibrium constant is, right? And so that's how we can define which direction it's spontaneous it will spontaneously go from starting even to making more product or go from being even to making more reactants, right? So that means that there's some relationship between equilibrium constant and delta G. I mean, so here's one way that we can look at this is if, if you start with, if you look at the free energy of the system, and so usually when I draw a potential energy surface on the board and I say this is this axis is energy, I'm usually talking about free energy. Meaning as a combination of enthalpy and entropy, we're talking about where something will move spontaneously. Um, if I'm talking just about the bonds, then that energy that I'm talking about is just just enthalpy and I'm ignoring the the entropy piece. Um, but if we start with all of product of our reactants, we're going to spontaneously make some product until we reach equilibrium, which is a minimum value of G. There's some theoretical lowest possible value of G that we can have for the system. And that's where your, your entropy and your enthalpy are balanced out such that you're not going to keep making any more product unless you change the conditions. Um, and so if we start with only A and B, if equilibrium is greater than one, if we favor making products, it'll spontaneously, you can think of it sort of sliding downhill until we get to this minimum value. And at that minimum value, delta G is equal to zero because delta, that's when the reaction becomes non-spontaneous anymore. And then on the other side, if we start with only products, it'll spontaneously react backwards at least a little bit until we get to that point where delta G equals zero. So in calculus terms, we call that a local minimum, right? Um, just means the point where it's lower than the other areas around it. And that, that also sort of makes sense. We're going to the point where it switches from being positive to negative, where it goes from being spontaneous to non-spontaneous. And, mem and remember, delta is the same as the slope of a line, right? Change in delta G. So where change in delta G is zero, that's going to be a minimum where everything's flat. 
calculus terms, we would see we would say the the derivative of free energy with respect to concentration is equal to zero. But really, what we're looking for is just the bottom of this potential energy well. And that'll tell us what K is, because K is defined as the products over reactants at equilibrium, right? First rule of equilibrium is products over reactants. And the second rule. So that allows us to actually use some algebra. And the idea that at equilibrium, delta G is equal to zero, we can actually use that to solve for an equation where we can say, okay, delta G, where, where this equation is equal to zero is when, um, is going to be when it's non-spontaneous forward and it's non-spontaneous backward. And we usually write this, I usually write this the other way as an exponential, um, which I don't have explicitly written here, but I can throw it into the equation editor real quick. The equation would be, if we just take, if we divide both sides by negative RT and then E to the power of both sides, we get K sub EQ is equal to, e to the, is it uh, forward slash delta? No, forward slash capital delta, g over rt. And I missed the negative sign in there, but you can throw that in. So all this equation is saying, this is the same equation as above, just rearranged using algebra, right? I just solved for K in this way, case. But this just comes from our definition of what free energy is and what K is. All right, so that means that if we know delta G, we can predict what K is. And if delta G is negative, then this whole, th this whole thing, you get a negative of a negative, you get a positive exponent, which means it's gonna be greater than one. It might be small, but it's still gonna be greater than one, right? Which means your equilibrium favors the products because the top half of your equilibrium constant is bigger than the bottom half, right? Because in, in really, really rough, estimate, even regardless of the stoichiometry, equilibrium is products over reactants. So if K is greater than one, you're going to make more products than reactants at equilibrium. And if K is less than one, you have more reactants than products at equilibrium. Right, so if delta G is negative, K should be greater than one. If delta G is positive, K should be less than one. But no matter what, K is going to be greater than zero because we have this exponential term. Right, so this, this is what we're going to turn around and apply to cyclohexane comp compromers because we can, we can take this and turn it into something where we can plug in calculated numbers here or predicted numbers from things like bond energies, plug that in for delta G, and we can wind up calculating what the equilibrium constant should be between two compromers. This goes back to RJ's question from last week, how much of this is actually real and how much of this is all theoretical? I mean, the math is real. The math is accurate. We can look at the energies and know the energies are real. If we wanna know what the difference is in terms of at room temperature, what is the, you know, how many of our molecules are in this conformer versus that conformer? We might have to calculate it rather than measuring it directly but it's not like it's purely theoretical and doesn't exist. It's just easier sometimes to calculate it than it is to find a way to measure it. So that's what we're gonna work on today. So today's assignment. So then there's a couple, we'll start with these. 
um, in lecture on Thursday. Um, so if you're given a delta G, we can use that to figure out if we should predict if K is going to favor products over rea or reactants. If you're given K, that tells you whether products or reactants are favored. If you know other information, like the temperature, delta H, and delta S, you have to go through another step, but that's all the pieces to get delta G. If you know delta G, you can predict products or reactants being favored. And when I say favored, I mean, what do you have more of at equilibrium? I suppose I should define that. Um, which usually corresponds to whatever is more stable, you're going to have more of at equilibrium. Um, so let me switch from these slides. Like I said, we'll go through those so you can see some the answers there. Um, so this lab, I, I don't feel too bad about telling you it's a little rough, but I also think it's a pretty good lab that's that's reasonable. Um, I kind of have it set up like some of the other ones we've done where there's some questions built in here that you don't have to do a full lab write up. Um, I kind of have it set up so you can can fill in spreadsheets as you're going and do some of the calculations as you're going. It's not all of them at the end. Um, and then it's got your definition of different strain. And then it's got some general procedures for, okay, this is how we look at a molecule, at a model in either the physical, physical plastic models or as, um, as a model on the screen. There are a couple keys that you can look for to tell you whether it's got these different kinds of strain. So remember, torsional strain is the strain that you get from things being eclipsed when they would rather be when they would rather be staggered. Steric strain is when you get things that are too close together and they push each other away. And angle strain is when your angles differ significantly from what the Vesper model says they should be. So that'd be 109 degrees for, for tetrahedrals. Right, so those are your guidelines for the types of strain. And, and so you're going to be looking at these different models um, which the models model kits are ready for you to pick up at LTCC today, by the way. Um, you do need your student ID card and you do have to wear a mask um, to pick them up, but uh, they're ready for you and they're over by the library um, at any point that the college is open, which is I think pretty standard hours at this point, you know, business hours. Um, so whenever, if you want to use those, Go ahead and pick those up whenever you're you're ready. Um, um, but I'm so I wrote this with the with the idea that you guys don't have these physical models, so you're mostly analyzing the digital ones on your computer screen to see these things. So you're going to be using applets, kind of like the one I was showing you earlier, to click and drag and and look at these things. Um, and the advantage of that is that it also allows you a way to actually measure angles instead of just eyeballing it. Um, and so if you click on the link that's in here or go to chemcompute.org, this is actually a, um, is run by a group out of Sonoma State, um, that their part of their research involves just keeping a public service, um, a miniature supercomputer called a cluster, um, which is basically a server rack that's designed to run calculations instead of just host websites. Um, it has a server, they have a server rack that they offer free access to for anybody. So you guys can, can use their computer to run the calculations. So you're not limited by your laptop or Chromebook or whatever. Um, and then to actually submit them, all you're going to do, and this is in the lab as well, um, is if you start with the skip straight to submitting a job, or if you go up here to games and go to submit a job, um, it gives you a couple, it kind of guides you through the process. And what this is actually going to do is it actually is, you start by either drawing a molecule here or um, I need to still upload all of these. Let me upload these real quick um, to the files and I'll put them in the assignment. 
um, as well. And this is a little clunky like this way. And you won't have to find them this way. I'm going to embed them. I just, this is the fastest way to upload a bunch of files at once. Um, and these are just going to be the XYZ coordinates. They're stored as a .xyz file, which is just plain text. That's just the, the extension is just telling you that it's just coordinates. And it has, it tells the different programs what the various um, uh, formats are. And so let me put them, embed them in here now too. Sorry about this, my, I, uh, like I said, I was working late on this last night and I did not finish. I think that's everything you need. If I missed anything, if you're missing any coordinates when you get to the, the experiment, just let me know. Um, again, these are all just, when you click on them, it'll just give you the, ask you to open or save any text editor, you can just open them with, um, or you can just download them and save them on and open them one at a time if you want, however you want to do that. Um, so the way that we'll actually open these, if I, if I open one of those files, um, I'm using a text editor called Notepad++, which is usually, um, used by it's used a lot by programmers because it's a lot better than notepad or wordpad but it's also not as heavy hard to run as um word and so it's it's kind of designed around that and it's useful for stuff like this um if you want to put in your own coordinates which is what you guys are going to be doing you go to this page and you hit open and then you just paste your all your coordinates in there and just make sure you get all of them from your text editor here you can get, it doesn't matter if you grab the first two lines either um, and then when you hit read coordinates and scroll down in 3d this will show you what the coordinates are that you just typed in so this would be if we had a totally planar cyclohexane as opposed to being in a chair or a boat confirmation um, and so what we're going to do is, is down here, we're, we're actually going to calculate these energies using quantum mechanics, not just by estimating things, um, which basically it, what it does is it uses the actual functions for the different orbitals and it mixes all the orbitals together. Um, and it basically just goes through a million iterations of it until it can find the lowest possible energy of all of the different orbitals, not really a million, but a lot. Um, and it and it basically just adds them all together and says, okay, well, whatever the lowest possible energy is I, that I can get by mixing these orbitals together, that's got to be pretty close to the real answer. Um, so it's basically doing the hybridization of these orbitals by hand. Um, and it winds up being relatively accurate. Um, things you want to double check, and again, these are in, in here, is make sure that this section looks like this if you use the wrong um these are relatively large molecules they're not that big of molecules but they're big as far as quantum mechanics goes um so we want to make sure we have everything set up right so that we're not asking too much of the computer or it's going to take it an hour and a half to finish your calculation um so you want to make sure you put a name in because it's going to give you an output file that you can save um, you don't have to put anything for comment. You can leave this the same. We want, we don't want a geometry optimization. We want a single point energy. The geometry optimizations take too long. So I've done those for you. Um, and then as far as add-ons, you don't need any of that. You want to make sure you pick this, this line basis set is like, which functions is it going to mix together? And the bigger your basis set is, um, the better your answer, but also the longer it takes to calculate. So we're going to go with a really low level basis set because we're going to get really 
these are really basics that we're, you guys are learning and we're not that worried about getting the right answers. We just wanna practice getting answers, period. Um, so you wanna click this 3-21G. Um, and then I think, I don't think there's anything else you need to check down here. Um, so once you get that all in there, again, biggest things are give it a name, single point energy, change the basis set to three. 3-21G. Then when you hit submit job, it's going to think for a second. And then you just start see it start scrolling numbers through. And this is going through the number crunching process of actually calculating these energies, plugging in different numbers for these orbitals and mixing them together to try and find the lowest possible energy. If you look really carefully, this first column is the total energy of the system and you see it keeps getting lower and lower and lower because we're trying to find the bottom of the potential energy well and this second line here is the change but from row to row so the closest closer this gets to zero the closer you are to your calculation being done although that does kind of fluctuate sometimes um so this will take a few minutes and you let this run and at the end, you'll get something. There it goes. Um, once it's done, it finishes everything out. Um, it'll actually load some results for you, including an energy and what the molecule looks like again. So when it comes to answering your questions and you want to describe what kinds of strain, what kinds of ener strain energy are present, um, this is going to be what you play around with, is this window. Um, and so it, it'll, you know, it'll allow you to do things like click and drag so you can line it up. And if you look down a carbon-carbon bond, you can see that the hydrogens are totally eclipsed, right? Which we know makes, is not very stable. That's got a significant torsional strain. And we can also do things like if you want to measure a bond angle, if you double click on one of the atoms, it opens up um, a little measuring tool. And first thing it does is just measure distances. But then if you click again, and then go to a third atom, you can measure the angles, right? So we can look at this and say, oh, it's 120 degrees. Tetrahedral is supposed to be 109. Therefore, it's got significant angle strain because it's significantly different than 109 degrees. Um, as far as what the rest of this stuff is, is we'll spend more time and I'll teach you about this stuff, um, later, but basically these are all the actual numbers for, um, the actual energy of the various atomic, um, and molecular orbitals. And you can see that they all kind of look kind of periodic and kind of weird. 3D shapes, kind of like P orbitals, but also not like P orbitals. Um, these are just the ways that you can mix the orbitals together to make this as low energy as possible. So the electrons can be as low energy as possible. And they just, they don't look like a normal orbitals would look like where we would normally be thinking about them as being between two distinct atoms. Um, this is the way the numbers work all out although we can then take this into a process that actually turns this into something a little easier to see and visualize what's going on. Um, but for this part, you do not need to worry about that. And now that I've clicked on in here, I'm not sure I can get out of this. There we go, reset display. Um, so that's gonna be the how you actually run the calculations. And again, make it look like this before you hit submit. Hey, Sean. Uh, yeah. I don't know if anyone else has tried to download the files yet, but mine will not open. Is there a... So do, I don't know what a Mac does when you try to open a file that it doesn't know the extension to. Windows says, what do you want me to do with this type of file? And then you just have to pick Notepad. I think you okay. might have to open note, Notes or whatever the, the Mac version of Notepad is. I'm using, I'm actually using a desktop right now. I'm, I've okay. got you on my Mac and this on a okay. desktop. So 
should I like, I don't want to waste everybody's time so we could deal. No, with no, this. no, no, you're not. Um, because everybody's going to have this issue when you go to download it. Um, like I said, mine, mine, I'm, I'm used to opening my computer knows what to do with these years. It'll say, it might not say, Oh, have a default chosen. Mm -hmm. um, but you should be able to open this and then pick, you know, something. Use you might text edit. Pick others, use text edit, use notepad. Um, you just need something that, you know, in theory, you could even open it in word or, or anything like that. Oh, you know, here we go. Like yeah. That. I've got notepad now. There you go. Oh, okay, cool. And so we have to do that with every single file that you um, gave us, right? Correct. It'll okay. take a little bit, but okay. you can, as you get, as you start getting results, you can, I would, I would recommend sort of streamlining lining it, run your first job, which won't take that long, start your next job running. And then while you're answering the questions and analyze the first one. So I have a couple tabs open. Um, and we're not all from the same, when we did this on campus, this, um, um, wound up uh slowing everything down because we were all from the same ip address and so it throttled our our usage of the uh computer there to not overwhelm it but now us all being different ips we should not get slowed down too much um if we were actually trying to do this for research or we we're looking at larger molecules or this was something that um i was going to be teaching you're taking a whole class on doing these these quantum simulations um, I would have you get this running on your own computers because a lot of times that's faster than waiting for their computer to do it. But for the sake of simplicity, this is this works pretty well. Um, so, and then the main thing, what we're going to start looking at is going to, we're going to, the main thing to, to keep when we're actually looking at your results is gonna be this electronic energy. Because it's electronic energy is going to be the number that allows us to, this is a, an absurdly large number. It's 60, 615,000 kilojoules per mole. This is the energy to actually create this matter from nothing. If you created this matter from nothing, it would be, it would be give off this much energy to do so. Um, that's not actually what we're doing. We're looking at a change. So the, the raw number here doesn't actually make any difference. We want to look at the difference between this and another state because we're looking at delta G, not just the energy. We want the change in energy. Um, and for the sake of this problem, even though the our equation that we were just talking about had it is delta G, which has that enthalpy term, and then it also had um, the entropy in there too. If we're talking about starting with one cyclohexane and then going through a ring flip to another cyclohexane, the difference in entropy is going to be negligible. It's going to be close to zero because you started with one molecule and then you end with the same molecule. So the change in entropy is going to be next to nothing. So all we're going to do to plug into this equation is we're just going to look at the energy calculated here, which is really delta H between products and reactants, but when we go through these ring, ring flips. And then I see a lot of puzzled faces or sort of pondering, maybe pondering faces might be a better way to describe it rather than puzzled, maybe puzzled too. Yeah, I think I missed that last part, sorry. Okay, so when we, question two here, says open a spreadsheet and write down your energy, the calculated electronic energy. That's that number right up here, which doesn't mean anything on its own, but when we compare that to something else, that allows us to say, okay, relative to some other state, this is you know, 100 kilojoules per mole less stable. It's uphill in energy, 100 kilojoules per mole or it's downhill in energy, 100 kilojoules per mole to go from having a methyl in the axial position to having a methyl in the equatorial position. So we're going to mostly be interested in the, the raw energy here, the actual number that it comes up with doesn't mean anything to us. 
we're only going to use that to then calculate a change in energy between two geometries. Sean, does, um, is the difference the same at, for, for enthalpy? Like, so if it's lower, it's gonna be giving, it's gonna be uh, giving off energy. So it's like endo or exothermic. Exactly, yeah. So okay. if, you have, if you have your methyl in an axial position, or if you're talking about like boat versus the, um, the chair conformation, boat is less stable. So when it goes from boat to chair, it's going downhill in energy, which means that that would be an exothermic process. If it's equilibrium, it's not going to be giving off a ton of energy one way or the other, um, but that's going to be you know, one way we can actually calculate what that equilibrium constant is, is by looking at that change in energy. If you had some way of taking cyclohexane and forcing it to all be in the boat conformer, and then you spontaneously let all of it relax to the more stable state, most of it would go to being a boat or sorry, a chair conformer, and that would be downhill in energy, and that'd be an exothermic process. We don't ever have a way, really, of, of restricting it such that we can keep it all in one conformer or another. So what we do instead is we calculate the energy difference this way instead of measuring it with something like calorimetry, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. All right. So then... First thing to do is going to be just looking at planar cyclohexane. And then I gave you a bunch of stable cyclohexane conformers. So that'd be chair cyclohexane and then the two and then twist boat, which is when it's in that boat form, but kind of twist tweaked sideways. And um, I will open that up in a different. Um, Let's see, where's the twist boat? So, and I'm using, I posted a link to this other, this other um, app for looking at these 3D geometries um, is called MacMole PLT. And I, I linked the download site for it. It's free, it runs on Mac pretty well, or really well, it runs on, on Windows pretty well. Um, and it's, it's got advantages over the one that's just embedded in that you can make it whatever site you want, and then you can edit the geometries a little bit easier too. Um, so if I wanted to look at this, so this is the twist boat confirmation. And so it's kind of like a boat, but it's kind of tweaked to the side to sort of make it so you don't have quite as much torsional strain as normal if it was the true boat conformer. Um, and so this, you're gonna wind up calculating energy for this, calculate energy for the chair conformer, and then calculate energy for what the transition states would be. So what that means is when you actually get these energies, it'll look, you'll be able to arrange them. So, you know, if you have, um, you know, your, chair, your twist, your boat, and the other one that's called a half chair. And so those are, let me turn on the light and get a little bit more light here. Um, if you have those written, you know, in a spreadsheet, what we'll actually wind up doing with that is turning it into a potential energy surface. I'm zoomed in too far, hang on. Um, so let's say we've got some random number here. I'm just gonna make up a number. Um, and let's say that this is negative uh, 605 and this is negative Six oh three, and this is negative. So these were the raw numbers that we were getting out from our calculations. Um, half chair should be negative five ninety or something like that. And these these are not going to be your right numbers. I'm just trying to get them relatively or right relative to each other. 
what this allows us to do is make a potential energy surface where instead of just eyeballing it and say, this is lower, this is higher, we actually can get a number and say, okay, if we start in the chair confirmation, So if we plot the energy calculated, which is really enthalpy over here, if we say, okay, I'm gonna start in the chair and then it's gonna go through a half chair to go from on its way to being the twist boat. And then if once it's in the twist boat conformation, which again, twist boat is gonna look something, it's gonna be kind of like the boat conformation, except twisted a little bit so that you, your, your uh, torsional strain is lowered. To go from twist boat in one direction to twist boat in the other direction, it's gotta go through another transition state, which is the boat. So this would be boat, this would be twist, to be half chair. And then it's gonna it's gonna repeat on the other side. And so that's that's gonna be a potential energy surface we can actually calculate directly this way. We're just looking at the maximums and the minimums in between. These maximums are transition states. The stable conformers, the chair and the twist boat are gonna be lower in energy than the transition states. And so this allows us to actually calculate these things instead of just making it purely theoretical and, and guessing at this, right? And so all of these, again, all of these different geometries are in the files that are listed. So you can actually have them and look at all of them. There's the, there's the twist boat, but if I opened up the regular boat, uh, you have to arrange it so you can see the boat properly. That's kind of set up as an upside down boat. You can see how it's got the two corners up. So that's not gonna be quite as stable as that twist boat because that puts all these hydrogens in, in the eclipsed form. If you twist it a little bit, you can lower that torsional energy, but we can get a transition state. We can get an energy for each of these and make our own um, potential energy surface. And so that's what the first few parts of the lab are, is having you look at these, identify the kinds of strain that they're gonna be there, the other reason I like MacMol is it allows you to do fun stuff like just make a molecule sit there and rotate, make fun gifts of molecules. Um, all right, so that's so stable cyclohexane conformers versus the sec the transition states. I already have the geometries for you, um, which is most of the battle. Actually, getting them to be accurate energies is pretty easy. The hardest part, the most computationally intensive part is actually finding the geometries because it does that by basically moving things in random directions until it gets to a more stable state. In fact, this is not what I would be having you do, um, but just to show you the actual process of finding a geometry optimization is if I took this planar cyclohexane, this is not very stable. It should be either chair or boat. And so if I, if you can do a really rough version of it by just hitting this optimize and it just kind of tweaks everything. And it actually didn't even do that great of a job of that because it made it, um, it made it totally planar still. Um, but basically it's just going to randomly go through here and tweak things until it settles into the most stable state it can find. So that's basically like doing all these other calculations 30 times in a row to try and find the best possible geometry. So that takes a lot longer, um, which was something that I spent 
all way too much time on when I was in grad school, it's finding the right geometries and transition states. So this, that's something that I know really well. So I did that for you because it's also incredibly frustrating if you don't know what you're doing. And I don't expect you to spend 40 hours a week on this. 20 maybe, but now probably not that much. Um, and then once you get past the cyclohexane ones, once you make your, your um, potential energy surface, um, it's gonna have you do a few more calculations um, and then use the numbers and the delta and the change in energy that you're gonna make to predict K for, for methyl cyclohexane. You're gonna calculate the energy of methyl cyclohexane with the methyl in an axial position, and then calculate the energy for, for the methyl in an equatorial position. So similar to what we've been talking about in class with these, with these conformers. Um, and then, but then once you have a change in energy, you can plug it into our equation here and get an estimate for what K is, for what the equilibrium constant is. Because it should be downhill in energy to calculate if you go from methyl in an axial position to methyl in the equatorial position. And we actually have numbers we can compare that to, right? Because we have in the textbook, or if you look at, not Gen Chem, um, if you look at the lecture from the other day when we first started talking about cyclohexane. So this is the one that we're making. Yours is not gonna be curved lines because you're only calculating the tops and bottoms here, but it's gonna look a lot like that. Um, but what I was actually going to look at was this chart. It says if you put a methyl here, the difference in kilojoules per mole should be around 7.6 kilojoule per mole difference between going from axial to equatorial, which should lead to a K value that, that means you should have about 95 um, to five as your products over reactants which means what's 95 over five is 19 to one. So your K value should be 19 roughly when you do this. And so you'll actually be able to compare numbers that you calculate to what they see um, in, the, in the real world. All right, I think that's most of the info you need. And so part three, is going to be almost more of a homework assignment. It's going to take you guys a bit. Um, it says, okay, for dimethylcyclohexane, there are six different isomers because you can have one, two dimethylcyclohexane, one, three dimethyl, one, four dimethyl. And then each of those is going to have a cis and a trans. So from that, you're going to draw all six of those. In their chair in both of their chair confirmations, to see which one, and then estimate what the amount of energy is going to be, what the K values are going to be. I mean, it doesn't actually have you calculate K; it just has you add up all the interactions to say, okay, this conformer is going to have a down is going to be downhill in energy by six kilojoules per mole estimating that by just look, drawing out the structure and then looking at all the different ways that these things can interact. So for instance, a, a one, one, three, if this is a methyl, if the green one is the methyl, you have a, a one, three diaxial interaction between this methyl and this hydrogen and this methyl and this hydrogen, each of which, um, will provide a, about 6.7 kilojoules per mole of strain. So the total kilojoules per mole of strain it would be the sum of those relative to if that methyl was in the equatorial position. And actually, now that I'm looking at these numbers, I might have overestimated that 7.6, and that's for, might be for, I don't remember if that's for each of them or if that's for 
Well, we'll go with what the what the um, lab says. I had a reason for writing it that way, so we'll stick with it for now. Yeah, that was one of the questions I had. If, if you could have favorable axial interactions or not, I don't know if you could have like a right. chlorine right. group with like a deprotonated imine group or something like that. I don't know. Um, in theory, you can. The, but it's going to be a, a competing process, right? Because you're also going to have the sterics of just physically having things too close together and comparing that to the um, com and comparing that to the attractive force that you would get if you had a partial negative and a partial positive next to each other. That's going to be a balancing act. So it, it would make it more favorable. But whether or not you could actually overweigh the sterics, I'm not sure. But that's part of what happens in protein folding, right? Is it arranges itself in a way so that you wind up with neg partial negatives next to partial positives, but they're still not going to be so close that they're overlapping. So you, there's that balance between are they going to be, in this case, on the cyclohexane hexane ring, would they be too close together and just be butting into each other? Um, because you still can't have that. You still need the, the room for the electron clouds to be there. Even if it's a positive charge, it has electron clouds, right? So there's, there's a balance there. But yeah, there are definitely competing forces in these as well. Um, and that's why we can wind up with some amount of strain being created, is, and that's more stable than allowing it to stay um, totally planar. Like, for instance, the cyclopentane. The angle strain on cyclopentane would indicate that the cyclopentane should be flat because that keeps it really close to 109 degrees. But that may that means it had too much torsional strain because those hydrogens eclipsed each other. And so you wind up with those two competing and where you get delta G equal to zero and where you reach equilibrium is when you can wind up with those forces more or less canceling out, sort of like buoyancy canceling out gravity and yielding a net result of no acceleration, if that makes any sense. Mind if I ask another question? Not at all. So is like torsional, steric, and angle strain all kind of measured in kilojoules per mole or no? Yeah, generally speaking, anytime we're, we're dealing with an energy, we're going to put it in something like kilojoules per mole. There are also what they call atomic energy units, where you're talking about the energy of a single atom or a single molecule interacting. Um, but those don't make quite as much sense because those, those energies are really, really tiny. Um, so, but yeah, it's, you know, the, we call them strain, but they're, we measure them as strain energy. We don't measure the actual torque itself or anything like that. We don't measure it as force, we measure it as energy. Um, and frankly, I'm not even sure how you would go about measuring, measuring the actual, I guess you would go about measuring the actual forces similar to the way that these calculations are run. You would actually just look at what are the different possible energies and how are they balancing each other out? What's the attractive force and what's the, what's the repulsive force? And those we could rate in terms of force units like Newtons or something like that. But as far as the actual strain, we, we look at it in terms of, of kilojoules. Any other questions? I think you guys have started working on this while I was talking, I would assume, um, because that's what I would have done as a student. Um, so keep working at it. I'm gonna stop recording at this point, um, unless I'll at least pause recording. And then if there's anything, if you guys come up with any good questions that I need to address, I'll start recording again, if you remind me, so you guys can get back to it. <laughs>